Okay, well, let me, um, let me just, uh, again, um, apologize in advance because some of this is going to be a little bit complicated. Um, you really, when we get to the passage I'm about to read, you are going to want to have your Bibles open for that because this, this is the one passage where we're going to do some math and calculate the timing of the coming of Christ. And sometimes doing math in our heads can be difficult. So we, we might want to maybe even jot those figures down <laughs> and do the, do the math on paper. Uh, but again, several of these things we're going to look at are going to be very familiar. Dates, I don't know. Do you know when David lived? Do you know when Micah prophesied? Uh, those are things you might want to jot down too because those are the time frames that these prophecies were given. Okay. All right, so let's begin with, with our text. The one we're going to spend most time on, but not first. So, if you open your Bibles <coughs> to this passage, excuse me, if you open your Bible to this passage, you might want to just keep it there. <coughs> okay, Daniel 9, beginning in verse 20. I'd like to read through verse 27. This is that very uh, famous, very well-known passage of the 70 weeks of Daniel. Okay. Now, remember, this comes as Daniel realizes that the 70 years of exile are just about fulfilled. He seeks the Lord through fasting and prayer, and it isn't for some time before Gabriel uh, comes to him, Gabriel tells him he was delayed because of a battle in heaven, and Michael came and um, basically freed him up so he could come and deliver this message. And this is where we pick up the, the, uh, the, the account. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. <coughs> Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. And I want you to notice the word place there is in italics, which means that's supplied by the translators and not in the original text, to anoint the most holy. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince who is to come, and that is Messiah, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Okay, even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he, still speaking about Messiah, will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate." Now, let me just say at the outset, that is not an easy passage to understand, but the part about the issuing of the decree and the timing to the coming of the Messiah and then his being cut off in the middle of the week, okay, makes perfect sense in light of what we know from the New Testament. So we are going to look at those elements this evening and not focus so much on, on the destruction that is following, though I do believe that's referring to 70 uh, A.D. By the way, if you come from a dispensational background, uh, you'll, you'll probably note that, that the interpretation of this is entirely different 
Uh, I don't have time to go into that this evening. Uh, I'm going to give you what I think is the right interpretation, and you're going to see it falls out exactly the way you would expect. Okay. So we did take a week off from this, so I'm just going to place, place us back, you know, put us in the context of where we are. So it, basically this, having shown that God exists through the creation, and so the possibility of there being a word of God, if there's no God, there can't be a word of God, so we start with God, existence, in the creation. We then turn to the claim the Bible makes to be that word. Now, so far, we've seen that if we simply look at the Bible as reliable history, we see it gives it to us several eyewitness accounts of Jesus doing things that only God could do. Jesus did miracles. That means Jesus is a prophet, God's prophet, one who speaks for him. And as his spokesman, Jesus tells us the Bible is his word. Okay, not only the entire Old Testament, the law, the prophets, and the writings, but also the entire New Testament. He claimed to be speaking the word of God. He promised to his apostles that they would write down the word of God as well. Remember what he said, that he would be with them, and also their associates who were, had oversight by the apostles. Now, that was the argument, okay, that R.C. Sproul gave us as to why we believe the Bible is the Word of God, but he gave us some others, but he didn't go into detail, so we were looking more at that particular evidence. The first thing we saw was that of all the books that claim to be from God, and there aren't that many, only the Bible describes the God we see in the creation. Okay, if you look at the God revealed in the other books, it's nothing like the God of creation, the God who is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and who is moral, okay, morally upright and good. Now, that's, those are the things we've seen so far. Last week, though, we started on another subject, and that is the prophecies that the Bible contains. Only the God who is revealed in creation could possibly tell us what is going to take place before it comes to pass. And remember, the reason he knows is because God of creation is infinite, and being infinite means he must be infinite in absolutely every way. If God possesses strength, he must have infinite strength. If he is present, he must be infinitely present. If God has knowledge, he must have infinite knowledge. And as a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that he does have infinite knowledge, and one way that he reveals that to us is by telling us what's going to happen many years before it actually takes place. And let's not forget, it's not just because he knows. He knows, and you might say his knowledge and his decree are actually the same thing. God knows what he's going to do, in other words, eternally. So his decree and his knowledge are the same thing. But his knowledge is even greater than his decree in this sense, if, just sort of as an aside, that God not only knows what's going to happen, he also knows what could happen under any given set of circumstances. His knowledge is infinite. Now, we started by looking at an example um, of a prediction of destruction upon a particular city that came about with, with just amazing accuracy, if I can put it that way. Uh, what Ezekiel, what the Lord said through Ezekiel was going to happen to the city of Tyre. Let me just give you a snippet of what we looked at. The Lord said to that city in Ezekiel 26, verses 3 through 4, Behold, I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring up many nations against you, as the sea brings up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and break down her towers, and I will scrape her debris from her and make her a bare rock. Okay. Now, Ezekiel said this in 586 B.C., and I know it can get a little bit complicated because when we're talking about B.C., we, we go the opposite direction in the numbers. So the larger the number, the, the further in the past it is, and uh, the smaller the number, the closer it is to the present. Okay, so that happened in 586. Within a few months, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Tyre for 13 years. In 392, Tyre was taken by the king of Egypt. Then in 332... Alexander the Great tore the mainland city down. Remember, Tyre had two parts to it, the city on the coast 
and the island city off the coast. He tore the mainland city down and used the material from that city to build a causeway to the island city. In other words, he scraped the city off of the rock and threw it into the ocean. And in doing so, literally fulfilled this prophecy to the letter. Now, God told us in advance, told his people this would happen. 254 years before these events actually took place so that we might know that he is the Lord and that we might know that this is his word. Now, this evening, we're going to consider, as I've said, some of the prophecies regarding Christ. And again, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies in his birth, in his life, in his death. And we're not going to look at all of them, but we do want to look at a few. So let's, let's just consider a few of these things. And again, some of these are familiar, but some of them may not be. First of all, the, the, I think the, the first prediction regarding um, Christ is the fact that he was coming. Okay? And we have the first prediction of this at the fall when he pronounced, God pronounced the curse on the serpent, the devil, who tempted them. Genesis 3.15, this is considered to be the first, um, the first declaration, the first revelation of the gospel. He says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Remember, God is speaking to the devil. Now, by putting enmity between the serpent and the woman, he was redeeming Eve back to himself because Eve listened uh, to Satan and fell in with him, became a part of his kingdom, a part of his camp. But God says, I'm going to create a separation again. I'm going to redeem her back to my, myself. And in doing so, we also know he redeemed Adam. Adam and Eve were both redeemed by him. By putting this en enmity, this hatred, between his seed or his offspring and hers, God was saying generally there would be war between those that belong to the devil and those that belong to him. Uh, Augustine, great early theologian of the church, said this is the establishing of the kingdom of, of heaven and the kingdom of the world. Okay, there's these, these two kingdoms, kingdom of light, kingdom of darkness, and citizens between both, and there would be irreconcilable warfare between them. But more specifically, this refers to that battle between the devil and the particular seed of the woman who is Christ. Because he said, he shall bruise you on the head. He, okay, the seed of the woman, he will bruise you on the head, that is the serpent, and, he, and you will bruise him on the heel. And what he meant by that, of course, was that Christ, who was coming through her, would crush the head of the serpent on the cross, and in the process, he would be bruised on the heel or he would be wounded, he would die. So, um, but in this process, as I've said, he would destroy uh, the devil. So this is the first prediction. And when does that take place? <laughs> so how, how many years ago did that prophecy take place? Well, it really depends on when you believe um, God created Adam and Eve. So I'm going to tell you what I think. This was around 4,000 B.C. So 4,000 years. When was it recorded? It was recorded by Moses. He's the one who wrote the Pentateuch and took the oral tradition and the revelation God gave him through the superintendence of the Holy Spirit and wrote down exactly what took place, but he did that. Moses, I don't know the exact date when he wrote it down, but Moses is believed to have lived between, or actually from 1528 to 1409 B.C. So we have, what, um, 1,400 years uh, before the event takes place. All right, so the Bible tells us Christ was coming. Secondly, the Bible predicts into whose family this seed or Christ would be born. Now, being the seed of the woman is not very specific, isn't it? Because everyone who lives in the world is essentially her children. But the Lord narrowed it down further, you know, through the, through the Bible. He said Christ would be one of Abraham's children. And again, the very familiar passage, Genesis 22, verses 16 through 18, 
Remember God called Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, his son, on an altar on <clears throat> one of the mountains in Moriah. And when Abraham showed his willingness to do this, the Lord spared Isaac, but he said this, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, Abraham lived between essentially from 1955, not A.D., but B.C., to 1780 B.C. So we're talking about a couple thousand years before it actually takes place. Paul tells us in the book of Galatians, we haven't gotten there yet in Galatians, but he tells us that when God said to Abraham, through your seed, all the, all the nations of the earth would be blessed, he was not talking about all the children of Abraham, but he was talking about a particular seed. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is a prophecy that Jesus was going to come in the line of Abraham. God further told us that he would come from the tribe of Judah. Uh, Genesis 49, verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. I was talking to Zach today about you know, how the, the names in Scripture mean something. The word Shiloh or the name Shiloh means him to whom it belongs. Now, what is the it that belongs to him? The scepter. Okay? The scepter is the power to rule. Judah would be the kingly line. Judah is the line from which, of course, King David came, but also the line that Messiah was coming uh, who would be king, and this prophecy was given to Judah while he was living, and Judah lived around 1700 to 1600 B.C. So again, we're talking about quite a long time before the event takes place. And of course, God tells us he would be the son of David. He said to David, when David wanted to build him a house, as we saw in our meditation, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now God made this promise to David. David's dates are 1041 to 971 B.C. And, you know, how do we know these things took place in, in the way that, um, that the Old Testament prophets say they did? Well, again, here's where the history of the New Testament records are important. And we've already seen that they've been established. The history of the New Testament is established by those who have actually gone out and examined what was said, compared it with what they see in archaeology, and they see that, hey, the history that's recorded here is accurate. Now, we see the fulfillment of this in the New Testament record. In tracing Jesus' lineage, Matthew writes this in Matthew 1, verse 1. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And in the genealogy, he also includes Judah. So, as it was predicted a couple thousand years before it takes place, it happens just as the Lord says. Now, thirdly, the Bible tells us how he would come into this world and who he would really be. Isaiah writes in those very famous passages that we often look at at Christmas time, Isaiah 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. And then Isaiah 9, verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government, kingship, will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. By the way, Eternal Father, don't get thrown by that, doesn't mean that Jesus is the Father. <laughs> it means that he is the Father of eternity, or the one who possesses eternity, the one who has existed 
from all eternity. That is who this one would be. Now, Isaiah lived from 762 to 680 B.C. And that, in that time frame is when he wrote these things down, when God gave him this revelation. Now, when Gabriel appears to Joseph in a dream, he says regarding Mary, Matthew 1, 21 through 23, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Now, here's, here's two more names, okay, with, with meaning. Jesus, he says, you shall call his name Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua. And Joshua is, is actually a sentence. You know, most Hebrew names are, are sentences in, in Hebrew, very short sentences. But it's a combination of two Hebrew words, Yah, Yahshua, Yah, meaning, it, which is the covenant name of God. It's a contracted form of the name Yahweh. And Shua, which means salvation. And together they mean the Lord is salvation. So the angel said to Joseph, name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. I think you see the connection. But he also said that he will be called Emmanuel. And what does that mean? Well, translated, it means God with us. Okay, God would be putting on human flesh and tabernacling among us, as John said. And then as John also records in John 8:58, Jesus said to the Jews, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. And by the way, I am is really what Yahweh means, okay? It means that he is the eternally existing one. Now what, you know, again, Jehovah's Witnesses will deny this, but what is Jesus saying here? He is saying that he is the covenant God of Israel. How do we know that's what he meant? Well, that's not only what he said, but remember the Jews, when they heard him say that, their response to it <laughs> was they took up stones to stone him because here was a man making himself out to be God. So the Bible predicts this one who was coming would be born of a virgin. Jesus was born of a virgin, and it predicted he would be God. That is what, in fact, Jesus claimed to be, and we know through divine, his divine credentials that he was speaking the truth. Okay. Fourth, the Bible predicts where Jesus would be born. Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Notice this one who's coming out of Bethlehem, okay, that he has existed eternally. That's, that's what Micah is saying. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. But Bethlehem is where he would come into the world, the one from the clans of Judah who would be ruler in Israel. So this king is going to be born in Bethlehem. Remember when the Magi were asked by Herod? When they, when they came to Jerusalem looking for the newborn king and they didn't find him, Herod says, well, where is he to be born when he called his his men together to find out. They answered him in this way in Matthew 2, verses 5 through 6, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So that's how they understood it, and that is, a matter of fact, where Jesus was born. Now, like Micah lived around the same time as Isaiah, 762 to 680 B.C. And we don't know with exact accuracy, you know, the date of their birth and the date of their death, but we do have a general idea. Now, here's where you need to put on your thinking cap, if you haven't already. <laughs> OK, 
Okay? The Bible tells us, fifthly, when he would come, not his birth, but when his ministry would begin and when it would end. And that is what we see in our passage. When I say end, I mean his earthly ministry because his ministry has not ended. Now, again, in the context in Daniel chapter 9, when he realized the 70 years of exile spoken of by Jeremiah the prophet were just about over, he set his heart to seek the Lord, to show him what was coming next. And in answer to his prayer, we saw the Lord sent Gabriel with a message. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Seventy years of exile were ending, and seventy weeks were about to begin that would bring about many things, not the least of which hope for Israel. Now, I think understanding the purpose that Gabriel gives for the weeks helps us to understand a little bit more about the time frame that's being spoken of here. Now, what I'm not going to quote all these things again because it's going to take too much time. So this is what you need to, you need to kind of follow along here. Let me see what verse we are in, verse 24. What, what follows with regard to the purpose of these 70 weeks are three sets, three groups of two things, okay? And each pair is referring to the same thing. And that's not unusual because that's, Hebrew parallelism, you know, parallelism. You have A, what's more B, okay? So the first thing that these 70 weeks would accomplish is to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, okay? What does that mean? Well, it means to finish or complete Israel's sins against God, their final rebellion by rejecting the Christ, okay? At least from this understanding, this is what it means. Secondly, he says to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness. What do you suppose that's talking about? Well, it's talking about the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And then thirdly, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Not place, but something that is most holy. So what this is referring to is it's going to, the, in, within these 70 weeks, it's going to fulfill or all the prophecies, the visions and prophecies regarding the Holy One are going to be fulfilled, and He is going to be anointed. Okay, if, if, if we want to supply the word place or temple, we still need to understand that Jesus is the temple. Remember what, what He said to the Jews when you know, he pointed to the temple and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they said, how can you possibly do that? How many years did it take to build this thing? But John said he was speaking of the temple of his body. Jesus is the true temple. So within these 70 weeks, Israel would fill up the cup of God's wrath by rejecting him, by rejecting God and his Messiah. They would put Messiah to death. In dying, he would atone for the sins of his people. But in the process, he would be raised and anointed as the mediatorial king over creation. That is the purpose of the 70 weeks. Now, Gabriel says, he tells us when these 70 weeks begin, okay, in verse 25, with the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, then he breaks that down into seven weeks, and then he breaks it down further into 62 weeks. Jerusalem would be built in the seven weeks. And then 62 weeks later, Messiah the Prince would come. And then in verses 26 and 27, after the 62 weeks, okay, it's getting complicated, or during the 70th week, Messiah would be cut off. By the way, if I, ha if I haven't mentioned this already, these weeks are not seven days <laughs> because we know it took much longer than 70 weeks for Jesus to come from the issuing of that decree, but rather these are 70 weeks of years, okay? So each week is a seven-year period. All right, so uh, one last thing let me just mention before we move on is that 
and we're not going to have time to really examine this, but following this, in this prophecy, the people of the prince who is coming, the prince who is coming is the Messiah, but his people would destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the temple, and that is referring to God's judgment in 70 AD. Now, we're going to look at that next week. So again, these 70 weeks are 70 groups of seven years, or 490 years. They begin with a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and they end with the coming of the Messiah and his death. Now, here's where things get interesting. When was this decree issued? In 457 BC, Artaxerxes, then king of Persia, issued a decree that allowed Ezra to return to Palestine to reestablish Israel's national polity and law. That paved the way for Nehemiah to return in 445 to rebuild the walls. This is the decree that starts these years, uh, the calendar, so to speak. Now, we need to do a little bit of math here, and this is where I, I think it would probably be helpful to if you have a pen and paper. Jesus was born, okay, in around 3 B.C. I know that sounds strange because the calendar used to be based on when we thought Jesus was born, you know, before Christ, B.C., Anno Domini, A.D., the, the year of our Lord. So he was born, the, the, the thought was around 1, but we, we now know that, he, that more accurately he was born more around 3, okay, B.C. Now Luke tells us that when he began his ministry, he was about 30 years of age. And that means that he began his ministry around 26, 27 A.D. Now again, these are not exact. It's hard to know the exact dates now. But it wasn't hard to know them back then, okay? Now, 26 A.D. is 483 years after the issuing of the decree by Artaxerxes in 457, or in other words, 69 weeks of years. Remember, from the issuing of the decree to the coming of Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 69 weeks and if those are years, it comes out to 483 years. And from the issuing of that decree to the time Jesus began his ministry was exactly that period of time. Now, when Jesus began his ministry, he says in Mark 1.15 something very interesting. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, that could mean one of two things or both. The, the time for the, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, you know, because Messiah is there. The prophecies are, are now being fulfilled in Christ. But one of those is this prophecy regarding when Messiah the Prince would come. And so he could easily be re referring to that as well. And if so, the Bible predicts the very year that Jesus began his ministry. Even if that's not what he meant, it still does. But it also predicts the year of his death. Okay, that's another interesting thing because we read in verse 26, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. Now, the 62 weeks follows the seven, and so it's talking about after the 69 weeks, the Messiah is cut off. Because remember the seven weeks and then 62 weeks, after the 62 weeks, Messiah is cut off. That's 69 weeks. So Messiah is cut off during the 70th week. Now, that, that's very critical um, for our understanding of this because dispensationalism believes that when the Jews rejected Jesus that, that Daniel's time, his, his clock, so to speak, the calendar, stopped, and the 70th week is still in the future. And that they believe to be the seven-year tribulation, which they see the book of Revelation speaking of, Matthew 24 and, and other passages. But I want you to notice that it's after the 62 weeks Messiah is cut off, but exactly when is he cut off in this 70th week, which begins after the 69th week, I want you to see. It isn't put on pause, okay, but we move into the 70th week. Well, oh, let me just mention this too. What does it mean Messiah is cut off? Okay, to be cut off, 
according to the meaning of that word, is to be put to death, okay? So after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be put to death. So when in the 70th week does this take place? Well, verse 27 tells us it's going to happen in the middle of the week, the middle of the week. This is what uh, Gabriel says. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That's talking about Messiah the Prince, not talking about the Antichrist that, again, dispensationalism is looking for. In the, con in the context, okay, it's talking about Messiah the Prince who is coming. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, which is not the, the abomination of desolation that the Antichrist is going to bring about when the Jews are allowed to rebuild their temple in Jerusalem. That's, okay, that, that's fiction, okay? I'll, I'll say that much. That, that, is, that is fiction. But what it's referring to is the crucifixion of Christ and the abolition of the Old Testament system of sacrifice. Now, if this is a week of seven years, what, what is the middle of the week? What, what's the dividing point? What's the middle of seven years? Three and a half years. How long did Jesus minister once he started? Three and a half years. Okay, and we can calculate that from the number of Passovers that he celebrated during his ministry. Now, in the middle of the 70th week, three and a half years into the 70th week, he puts a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and he does it through the sacrifice of himself on the cross. Remember what happened when Jesus died on the cross, when he cried out and yielded up his spirit? We read in the Gospels that the veil of the temple, uh, which separated the holy place from the holy of holies, was torn from top to bottom. And that was a very thick piece of fabric. No human being could have done it. But the tearing of that by God shows us that the way into the Holy of Holies has been revealed. But it also tells us that the Old Testament sacrificial system was no longer the way that we could approach God. Jesus put an end to the sacrifice and grain offering through the sacrifice of himself in the middle of the 70th week, okay? Now, what happens during the, the last half of that week? Read the book of Acts, okay? Jesus is raised from the dead. He ascends. All those things take place. Nothing significant happens in those three and a half weeks as far as, you know, fulfilling prophecy. But things that are significant do take place. Uh, and the destruction of the temple that is referred to by Daniel does not fall within the 70 weeks. That's another thing that we have to, um, to note here. Okay, now again, that, that's overload. I know that's a lot of information. But let me just say this. Daniel lived from 623 to 538 B.C., and that's when he wrote this. And he predicts, again, when Messiah is coming and when Messiah is going to die, lay down his life, with amazing accuracy. Now, we've already seen uh, from this, past pa this last passage when, you know, how he would die. I mean, I, I filled that in, but the Bible does predict how he would die, and that would be through crucifixion. Remember on the cross, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said that not only because in his human nature, the Father had forsaken him because he became our sin bearer. But he also said that, that he might draw our attention to Psalm 22. Psalm 22 predicts the death of Christ by crucifixion, as well as other things that would happen surrounding the crucifixion. Let me just read two verses, verses 16 through 18, or three verses. For dogs have surrounded me, a band of evildoers has encompassed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Does that sound familiar? It sounds like a commentary on what took place at the cross. And David wrote this psalm in 1000 B.C. 
Jesus is pointing them back to tell the Jews who were present at the crucifixion that God said this was going to happen. And this is the fulfillment of that psalm. Okay, so, but for us, as we look at it, again, it's, it's a prediction that takes place over a thousand years before the event actually takes place. And then finally, the Bible tells us that Jesus would not be left in the grave, but that he would be raised again. Now, David, again, writing in the Psalms, says this, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, and Sheol is not hell, Sheol is the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. In other words, you're not going to be in the grave long enough to decompose because you're going to be raised from the dead. That is the psalm that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost to prove to the Jews that the resurrection was prophesied by David. And he was one of the many witnesses to the fact that this actually did take place. And again, David wrote this about 1,030 years before it took place. So let me just summarize what we've seen because th this is the point. The Bible predicts the coming of Christ, the family into which he would be born, who he would be, where he would be born, when his ministry would begin, when he would die, that he would be raised again to life. I should say also the manner in which he would die, that he would be raised again to life. And all these things happened hundreds, sometimes thousands of years later, exactly as the Lord said they would happen. Now, these are just a few of the many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. But I hope you understand that's certainly enough to prove that the Bible is the Word of God because only God can tell us what's going to happen before it actually takes place. Even if He did it the day before, that would be amazing, and only He could do it, but hundreds, thousands of years beforehand. Uh, again, the, the Bible is an amazing document that shows us in many ways that it is the Word of God. Well, let's, um, let's just bow in a moment of, of prayer, and let's just thank the Lord that He has revealed these things to us, given us His Word. And by the way, let's not forget the other application here. Not everything that God said is going to take place has actually happened yet. There are still things that are in the future. So if God has that kind of a track record, <laughs> we need to believe that what He says is going to take place is going to take place. There's no question because He is the one who says it.